If you were trapped on an island full of flesh-eating monsters, what would you do? You'll need to team up with terrifying animals, bloodthirsty mercenaries, and one true island god in order to escape and get home alive. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Hollow Earth monsters in Skull Island. These explorers will be forced to battle underground monsters, and almost all of them will die. Charlie here is busy helping his researcher dad explore the depths of the dark ocean. He secretly wants to quit the family business and go live a normal life at college. So he talks to him about it, but his dad tells him that they're going to talk about it later, because he wants to focus on the bombs right now in order to map out the ocean floor, not realizing that these bombs will awaken something horrifying beneath beneath the sea. And just then, Charlie sees someone floating near their boat, right near the active bombs. He yells at his team to stop and jumps in to rescue her, bringing her back up. But something is very wrong. She wakes up and desperately asks them, where is her dog? But these people have no idea what she is talking about. And the crew investigates who this woman is and pour her a cup of coffee. But she doesn't know what coffee is. Charlie tries to radio for help, but this woman begs him to not call anyone because someone terrifying will find them. And the crew tries to reassure her that they're the good guys. Charlie's dad even introduces himself as Cap. What a lame name. And also, so does Charlie's best friend here named Mike. She tells them that she escaped a ship because the sky was on fire, confusing the crap out of everybody. But then they see a flare light up in the sky in the distance and rush over to check it out. The girl yells at them to not go see it, but Cap reassures her that that everything will be fine. She asks Charlie how many guns do they have because they need to get ready for war. But he says, well that sucks. They have none. Outside the crew sees a boat approaching, but find it really weird because nobody's radio contacted anybody. And just then, the boat disappears within the storm. Back in the captain's deck, Charlie tries to get to know his new friend. And he manages to scrape up enough machismo to find out that her name is Annie. And he tells her that they are mapping out the ocean floor, which is really cool because they get to set off deep sea bombs, but that's when Annie's face turns white at the sound of what he just said. She tells him that they need to stop the bombs because they'll awaken the monster that stranded her here in the first place. Still very confused, he runs to go tell his dad what his new cute friend has just said, and nobody notices that two assassins have just snuck onto the boat. Charlie tells his dad what Annie said, but he just goes, ah, and laughs it off. But that's when loud bangs are heard coming from the cockpit, forcing everyone to follow this wild goose chase inside. They are stunned to see Annie having just taken out an assassin and also declares that she has just destroyed their radio. She tells them that she is not going back on the boat that she came from. And by now at this point, everybody has just gone, you know what, all right, enough of this. We wanna know what the frick destroyed her boat and why are you so freaking scared, lady? That's what they ask her. And right then, an assassin wakes up and quickly pulls out his knife. And the second assassin about to pounce gets silently dragged off the boat by what looks like a giant tentacle. Back on the deck, the assassin tells Charlie's crew that if they keep looking for creatures under the sea, they're going to wind up dead. Unless they head back to his ship. But that's when this tentacle slams one of the captain's crew members onto the window and whips him back out to the sea as his screams disappear in the distance. Annie yells that they need to get off of this boat now! And everybody runs outside, but that's when Mike's dad gets crushed by a giant tentacle. The crew stops and stares in shock. And then Mike taste tests something that he never wished he had. And just then the boat begins to violently shake and one by one more tentacles rise from the dark seas. And by now at this point, complete chaos has taken over the ship. Explosions go off and Cap watches all of his crew members quickly die horrible deaths. Annie gets her handcuffs off and yells at everybody to get to the island and jumps into the water. The group gets separated and the ship quickly plunges down into the sea. Dragged into the water, terrified and confused, Cap comes face to face with the mythical monster. Looking into its soul, he fails to come comprehend the horrors that his family is about to experience. Struggling for breath, he tries to escape, but that's when Annie shows up and saves him, and some of the survivors return to the surface. Nearby, washing ashore on this mysterious island, Charlie and Mike realize that they've become separated from the other survivors, alone, afraid, and without their parents, they try to figure out their next moves. Okay, we can't find our parents, and also our best friend just lost his own dad. That is why in order to survive, obviously we need shelter, we need food, and we need water, but if we can't find water, we might have to drink our friend's coffee-filled pee. Let me explain. 
The crew did everything wrong from start to finish. Why are they using bombs to map the ocean floor? There's more modern ways and oh I don't know more subtle ways to do this. You can use sonar. What a concept that is. You can use stereo cameras. You can use strobe lights as a means to create a 3D mapping of the ocean floor in that area. They didn't have any of that stuff which makes everything about this whole operation super suspicious. Because then that tells me this crew either are idiots but on top of that we got a freaking tentacle monster yanking the boat down into the water. We're totally screwed. So aside from that cluster of a situation we're now stranded on an unknown island we know nothing about so we're not out of the woods just yet because as i said at the beginning we got to find food shelter and water but there's no guarantee that there is fresh water on this island and in fact islands are usually characterized by their limited supply of fresh water some people have only been able to survive on islands by developing their own rainwater collection system it's really complex and there's usually a lot of trial and error if we cannot find water anywhere and we can't collect it fast enough we might have to drink our friend's coffee filled pee Look, if I was Charlie, my friend Mike's dad was known as the coffee master. And because of this, it's likely that his son drank a lot of coffee, which means he's gonna pee a lot faster than I would, which means I might have to drink his urine in order for me to be able to survive. The next morning, Mike notices an injury on his chest from the disaster last night. But he thinks, eh, it's no big deal and doesn't say anything. What an idiot. And just then, a ferocious crab comes out from the sand and attacks him, pulling him away to consume his flesh. But Charlie saves him in the nick of time, and the two barely escape with their lives. Thinking it's over, but then they realize that this entire beach is infested with these monsters. They try to head towards this rock, the only hard surface around, and get on top of it. And then they see the crabs disappear, but now they realize they're trapped on here as well. Mike quickly has an idea, and they throw this weird rock bug into the distance, and the crabs swarm it, and Charlie and Mike make a run for it. However though, this one crab spots them and guns for their flesh, about to sink its teeth into them, but then they get saved by none other than Annie. She orders them to work together as they take down a few more monsters and then Charlie and Mike run like hell towards Annie. Since Annie found this spear, Mike now thinks that there are other humans living on this island, and they don't notice another crab tracking them. It gets ready to attack, but then a giant roar from across the island stops everybody in their tracks. The fear in the air is palpable. It causes all of these monsters to retreat into the sand, and Annie looks at them in disbelief and tells them that she doesn't know what they just heard, which means they must be on alert. Not trusting her fully, Mike questions her some more and finds out that she actually came from a different island before she was kidnapped. She's never been here before and has no clue where they are. Knowing what this means, Mike begins to sweat and tells Charlie that because of everything that has happened, he thinks he knows where they really are. Skull Island. And that's when Mike spills the beans what he really knows. Before they left the sea, Mike and his father brought an old map of this island from an old GI soldier, which means this must be where they are, because this isn't any ordinary island. He begs Charlie to forgive him, but then they suddenly get stopped by these lost soldiers, and then realize that, oh, what did you know? Annie has now disappeared. Elsewhere, Charlie's father, Cap, wakes up on a different side of this island and quickly begins searching for his son. He soon finds small smoke at the distance and heads towards it, but then he hears something following him. Turning around, the rock opens up and reveals the most beautiful crystals that he's ever seen, mesmerizing him, right as a sinister creature's face appears from within the rock and approaches him, but suddenly gets shot by this soldier, angering the bug and it charges at him to kill him. Cap then snaps out of it and sees this strange woman here freaking out and running away. He quickly catches up with her and finds out that her name is Irene, and she's as lost as he is. She got shipwrecked earlier while on a cruise ship and is now stranded. And just then they hear a loud roar in the distance, sending shivers down their spine. And Cap tells her that they need to move. Continuing to the location of the smoke, they spot a bunch of soldiers in the distance, but something is off. Cap then reveals to Irene that he knows she is full of shit. These men are her men, and she can't fool him. And he confesses that he doesn't want any trouble. He only wants to find his son, and he'll help her look for what he thinks she wants, that girl that came on his ship. Annie. Back at Charlie's location, these men hold these kids up at gunpoint. They say they are looking for a young girl, but Charlie asks them if they've ever seen his dad. The conversation is cut short as Annie surprise attacks them, and they try to reach for their weapons, and that was their biggest mistake. Because then they see something charging at them, weighing probably over 10,000 pounds, and it's coming right at them. Annie smiles though, and these two boys look on in shock as this new monster busts in, grabs Annie's arm, and flings her away in the distance. Thinking she's now dead, Charlie and Mike start running in the opposite direction 
direction, but soon get tackled by this confused looking soldier, hearing terrifying incoming noises. They hide in these bushes and the soldier is pissing his pants. He tells them that this monster has already killed six of his best men and Charlie gets mad and asks why the hell did they bring the monster that they just saw to this island? But the soldier says that they didn't. He reveals that it has been following Annie since they took her and it must have swam all the way to her here on this island. Mike thinks that the monster ate her and that she's dead, but oh, doesn't he wish, the soldier says. And that's when Charlie realizes that the monster that they are hiding from is Annie's pet. They then hear a rumbling of noises coming at them. The soldier makes a run for it and the boys chase after him. Approaching this mud pit, he suddenly gets eaten by a crocodile and more start swarming them. Mike panics and says not to move a muscle as they get closer to their death. And this one stands up, but they quickly realize that this isn't an ordinary crocodile. Backing up slowly, they sprint for their lives, jumping into this water, while these creatures try to catch them with their teeth. Oh my gosh, okay, let's think about it. We're two teenagers, we're on an island that we've never seen before. You've now seen a giant monster dog thing that's freaking huge. It's eaten six people. Oh, and by the way, there's a giant squid thing in the ocean. And on top of that, there was a freaking roar that shook the entire island. We are so screwed. Now we gotta deal with this giant prehistoric looking alligator crocodile thing. So here's how we're gonna get out of it. I'm gonna have this giant prehistoric looking gator thing play a game of tag. Let me explain. If this giant crocodile bites me, we're dead. We are so toast. And you wanna know why? Because a regular alligator has a massive bite force and then it could easily stop, drop, and roll and twist and rip my arm off. Yeah, sounds like a bad day. And this thing is bigger than a normal crocodile or alligator. And according to scientists, ancient alligators or crocodiles, they had a bite force of over 18,000 pounds, which is more than the T-Rex, which has 12,000 pounds. But I gotta tell you, my weebs, they did everything wrong from start to finish. First, they should have picked a different career choice and have not gone on that boat. And two, don't jump in the freaking water! Crocodiles can swim. And fun fact, the modern crocodile can actually go pretty quick on land, but they can go even three times faster in the water. The best move that we could have made instead would have been to run back the way we came here, or at least in any direction away from this freaking river that you see right here. Because where there's one mature croc, there's usually another 20 since they live in groups. And also running away in a straight line is a terrible idea. You gotta go zigzag, you gotta change your direction on the regular. Cause like I said, the modern crocodile is pretty quick on land too. But if it comes down to it, we can always let Mike take the fall and be our meat shield. Sorry, Mike. Struggling for breath, the monsters try to pick at their flesh, but then suddenly run away. Mike says that thank the Lord they must be safe, but Charlie realizes that they're headed straight down a waterfall, and they realize it's too late. Going over the edge, they plunge deep into the dark cold water, but come out alive, finally free, they happily let down their guard, and that was their biggest mistake, because then a giant crocodile swan dies from over the falls down towards them and disappears into the water near them, forcing them to swim like hell, gaining on them. The monster is about to rip into their flesh, but then it gets picked up by the king of the island of monsters, King Kong. He casually walks past the boys and ignores them while they watch in awe. That's when the creature from earlier pops in front of them with Annie, scaring these two. But she casually says, yeah, that's the big monkey elsewhere. Cap sees some injured soldiers returning to Irene's camp. They report that they ran into some boys that went this way, annoyed. This guy jokes that he's gonna kill Annie. But Irene looks at him dead in the face and makes him remember his mission to bring her back alive. This man updates them that their rescue chopper will arrive soon and with it they'll be able to take down this beast that is with Annie and finally escape this hellhole. Irene says that they put a tracker in her handcuffs and asks if Cap knows about this place since he's an explorer. He says based on his expertise he thinks there's a magical fountain located somewhere on this island which is way more believable now considering all the strange things that they've seen since they've got here. Cap also asks what she wants with Annie and she tells him that they didn't kidnap her but they found her 20 miles away from here on another island. There they found her all alone and was living with that monster. And they both were incredibly violent. Then they come across the sea of flowers, but notice that the field has been destroyed by a massive force of wind from something. And then a piercing screech is heard in the distance, and this giant firebird descends from the cover of clouds to kill them all, kidnapping this one soldier, and it tries to get away, not letting any danger stop them. And with the coast clear, they press on, and this soldier says that she's finally fixed Annie's tracker, which means they can now hunt her down. Reaching the sea, they finally make contact with their incoming helicopter, and think they'll finally be saved, but that's when their hopes are are quickly extinguished. The sea near them starts rumbling, and this giant tentacle shoots out from below and grabs the helicopter right from the sky, ripping it apart and killing everyone on it in less than five seconds. All the while as the group on the beach watches in terrifying disbelief. Everyone quickly realizes how trapped they really are. Without a helicopter though, she comes up with a new plan to get Irene, and she asks Cap what he thinks about the bird that they just saw, and he tells her that he thinks the bird came down from a nest, but then flew to a second nest since it headed in the opposite
opposite direction that it came from. This solidifies Irene's theory, and she announces her new plan to catch Annie and separate her from the monster she is with. They will lure Annie and the monster here, and bait the Firebird into helping them out. Once they have Annie, they will finally be able to leave here. But knowing what's waiting for them in the ocean, Cap asks Irene, how will they escape through the water? She tells him that she hasn't figured out that part yet, but for now, they should just focus on retrieving Annie. Meanwhile, the boys continue to follow Annie through the jungle, and Charlie tries to find out how much Mike knows about the island. But he says that the old GI revealed to him that other boats were hired to find this island as well. Because of its location, it doesn't show up on any radar. It means that it can only be found in person. But Mike says that he doesn't know why they're looking for the island in the first place. And he stupidly never asked his dad about it either. Okay, here's a crazy thought. They could have figured out everything from the moment that old GI told us what he did. Because look, the clues were all there and I mean everything. Let me explain. First off, Mike and his dead dad were so stupid to not tell their crew what the old GI told them. Because with a little bit of deductive reasoning, we could have easily figured out that this island didn't make any sense from the jump. First off, it was either fake or the most dangerous thing on the planet. Why would it not show up on radar? This island shouldn't exist. And the problem is, what we know about science is really, really little. We've only discovered about 5% of the secrets of the universe. That mean 95% of it we don't know crap about. So maybe you think it's possible to find a freaky island? Yeah, it's entirely possible. And also, fun fact, over 65% of our planet remains unexplored, most of which it lies beneath the ocean. So for context, check this out. According to NASA, it's easier to put a person in space than it is to send a person to the bottom of the ocean. Why? The pressure. The pressure exerted by the water above is equivalent for one person to try and support 50 jumbo jets. And while we know a lot of what's beneath the Earth's surface, most of which we've never actually explored, we've actually never been anywhere near the Earth's core due to the level of heat, pressure, and radioactivity. And this means that everything we know, we really don't know 100%. So in short, my weebs, this island is super weird. There's not many of them. There's just one freaking big one. Kind of makes me think that this island is not safe and we should never have gone on it in the first place. All the signs were there and we chose to go to it anyways. They are idiots. The kids take a break from walking. Charlie then goes to talk to Annie, but finds out her dog's name is Dog. Annie reveals to him that the bad guys are after her, but she doesn't know why. They invaded her home and started shooting at her dog. And the next thing she knew, she woke up and she was in handcuffs. She doesn't know how long she's been on her island for and doesn't even know her age. She reveals that she helped his dad escape the boat earlier and that he is on the island too. Shocking Charlie. And he notices something even more shocking in the distance. King. Kong. Hungry. Annie announces that they're going to get breakfast. Charlie then wakes up Mike, but then he realizes that his wound on his chest is starting to get worse. Looking for food, Mike and Charlie spot this strange looking bird. It approaches them fast and it gets ready to kill them, but that's when Annie and Dog show up again and slaughter the bird, telling them that they've caught breakfast. While eating, they find out how Annie and Dog met. She says their dads killed each other when she was younger, leaving her and Dog all alone. They joined forces then and then took over the island that she came from. Finishing up, they carry on and discuss how they'll leave the island. It's not going to be easy. They can't build a raft because of the terrifying creatures in the sea. But that's when Mike realizes that the guys chasing them must have radios. If they could steal it, they could maybe call a plane. But their conversation is cut short when Mike realizes that someone is missing. Hearing sounds from this dark hole nearby, they go to check it out and hear his screams. They find out that Charlie has fallen down deep into this cave, realizing where he is and Annie tells Mike the worst news of all. He's fallen into a flesh-eating bug's home. Mike tells Annie to make her dog get Charlie, but the dog doesn't want to because he only cares about Annie. Mike tries to convince the dog, but it walks away, causing him to get mad that Annie isn't helping Charlie, even though he saved her earlier. So what does he do? He points out the obvious. And he tells Annie that you're a bad friend. And that pisses her off and says, she's a great friend. Meanwhile, down in the hole, Charlie pulls out something and discovers an old sword. Mike then suddenly jumps jumps down and says that hey he's here to save him because Annie's dog is useless. More rumbling is then heard outside as the giant ape crosses over their path, pulling out this tree from the ground and shaking the entire earth. With the terrifying show over, Charlie tries to focus on getting out. Mike grabs his chest and secretly wheezes in pain, but tries to hide his suffering from Charlie. That's when this skeleton starts moving, causing Mike to run behind Charlie and they prepare for what's to come. But that's when Annie quickly swings down into the hole to join them. She and Mike get into a 
cute argument about their hand size about who is stronger, and they get confronted by the monster that lives there, approaching them drooling in hunger. Charlie tries to attack it, but his sword breaks, and out of options, him and Mike prepare to kick the bucket. Annie smiles and then announces that she will perform a magic trick for them. Approaching the monster, she collapses in front of it and begins crying out for help like a little baby. The two boys watch and stared, confused as ever, and she tells them that the fun is about to begin. And then right on cue, bursting into the cave from up above, Dog sees Annie in trouble and comes charging down like the white knight that he is to save her. Elsewhere, this soldier asks Cap why he got into the exploring business, and he tells him that one time he saw something magical in the ocean, twice the size of any boat he's ever seen, and made up of the most beautiful colors he could ever imagine. Since that day, he made it his mission to find those creatures and prove that they exist on Earth. He claims that there are mysteries on Earth that science cannot explain, but they do exist, and one of them is the legend of the Fountain of Youth. He thinks this island is connected to it, and that this place might be a gateway into a hollow Earth. An Earth inside of the Earth that we know, and this is where all these strange creatures have come from. And then Cap switches the questioning and tries to figure out more about Irene. She says she's a botanist, but that she's not here for plants. Just then, the soldiers get radioed in that everybody is in position to capture Annie. Irene reveals that she thinks Cap's kids are with Annie. And then Irene sees Cap giving her a look about all the weapons, and she tells him that if she's not careful, Annie's dog will kill more of her men than it already has. And everybody waits. Back at Charlie's location, the three continue to bond over cute crap that I'm not going to talk about, and that's when Annie's dog senses something in the distance and starts growling. Realizing who it is, Annie says people with guns are headed their way, and she shows them the bullet wound on dog and tells them that these people tried to kill her pet. Because of this, she will find the woman who did this and take her down. And so she quickly gets ready for battle, not realizing that something even more terrifying than the soldiers is watching them. She tells Charlie and Mike to wait in these bushes while she handles business because apparently Mike and Charlie are weak little wusses. Charlie then finally notices that something is wrong with Mike because he's burning up and she charges over them into the field of battle, not realizing that she's just fallen into the soldier's trap and quickly gets surrounded and shot in the neck with a sleeping dart. Noticing Annie in trouble, Dog starts chasing right at them to save Annie, but Irene tells the men to not shoot it, but to just wait. The dog gets closer and closer and the soldiers start to get nervous, but just then the firebird snatches the dog mid-air, blowing everybody away violently. They then see the bird taking the helpless dog back to its nest. Meanwhile on the bushes, Charlie spots his dad within the group of soldiers and thinks that he must be held hostage. Feeling guilty for all of this being his fault, Mike tells Charlie to find a way to help his dad, and he stands up from cover and gets spotted by the tense soldiers. He walks out to say hi to Charlie's dad, giving him a hug and secretly whispering that Charlie is safe, but then says out loud that he doesn't know where Charlie is, and then he notices Irene. And the two stare confusingly like they know each other. Hearing the screech of the bird in the distance, Irene quickly tells everybody to go back to their base camp for the night, carrying with them a sleeping Annie, but all the while, Charlie watches everything from the distance. Okay, yeah, I know this was a shit show to begin with, but let's get that out of the way. We're going to need to take a step back way up in the sky and look at everything from a good bird's eye view because I can't hold it back any longer. Because why is everybody keeping secrets? Mike's dad, Cap, Irene, what is with all the secrets? You don't need to. Mike should have shared that, hey, I'm hurt. This is a problem. It's getting worse. But what does he do? He tells nobody. There's literally no reason why he should not have told us. And he didn't even pretend to work with these two or get their insight on things. If I was Charlie, I, at the very least, would have made her realize that taking on highly trained armed soldiers with a simple pet is probably the stupidest thing you could possibly do. Yes, her stupid pet is huge. It's monstrous. It's impressive. But they got guns and modern technology. They could have something with big enough firepower to take it down. Look at this. It's fairly obvious in an open field what they were trying to to do. Since they had guns, it would have been obvious for this terrain to favor the soldiers. And since we knew that these soldiers were after Annie, we could have lured them away to somewhere else where Annie had a better situation. Because the area that would have helped Annie and her dog the best would have been close quarter terrain within the jungle or mountain areas. Because no matter how strong Annie thinks her dog is, one against 20 guys with guns was stupid as hell. Charlie thinks of his next move, but that's when he hears a noise and something approaching him. He bolts right fast as hell and he runs through the same open field from before and that was his biggest mistake. A firebird grabs him out of nowhere and takes him high up into the sky, dropping him down into this unknown location. Quick
quickly getting his surroundings, he realizes that he's been trapped thousands of feet in the air in this creepy temple. Back at the camp, Cap watches over Annie, but sees Mike and Irene talking suspiciously. Mike then enters the tent and confronts Charlie's dad about where Charlie really is. He whispers to him that he thought Cap was a hostage, and that's why Charlie is hiding, waiting for the right time to save them. Mike then starts to lose it again and complains that he now has a splitting headache and is at the end of his rope, and he confesses to Cap that this expedition was actually funded by Irene's team in secret. They knew he didn't like private money, but this was the only way to fund his dreams of exploring the deep ocean. Cap then, like a good mature man, moves past this information and tells Mike, despite his dad's death, he will always have a home with them. Oh, that's so nice. But then he notices Mike's vision going bad and makes a joke before returning to the main topic. Mike tells him that another ship she hired earlier found the island that Annie was on one month back and that they sent its location before they disappeared. Mike also asks Cap if he's seen the giant monkey walking around the island, but the captain says he has no idea what he's talking about. Back at Charlie's position, he hears more sinister sounds approaching him and gets ready to run away for the twelfth time, but then discovers Annie's dog is there with him, angry and afraid. Dog growls at him, but Charlie tries to calm it down, realizing he's out of options. He begins to get desperate and starts talking to himself, finding out that the dog recognizes Annie's name when he says it, and he gets an idea, and he tries to communicate with the dog to get him out of here by acting out what he wants him to do. He pretends to climb down this giant temple, and Dog finally recognizes what Charlie's trying to do and copies his actions. Seeing this, Charlie quickly runs to get on the dog, and the two get ready to work together to escape. But that's when they notice the temple artwork on the walls in front of them. But that's when they hear sounds approaching them, and they finally see the king of the island closer than they've ever seen him before. The entire area shakes, and the vibrations make Dog lose his grip, sending the two to fall down the wall fast. Barely landing somehow without a scratch or any broken bones, Charlie tries to take a sneak peek of the gorilla, but notices him playing with a necklace on the wall and looking sad. He then goes to meet Dog, and the two get to work to getting back to Annie alive. Back at camp, Irene goes to check on Annie and makes comments about how bad Mike is starting to look, and then she reveals that she knows Cap's son Charlie is somewhere nearby, and he confesses that he would likely try to sneak into this camp at some point. Irene then rolls her eyes and says she'll tell her men not to shoot him. A violent whistle is then heard up high in the sky and cause everybody to go check it out, and that's when they see it. A whale flying, but it's dead, and its giant structure majestically soars past them. Charlie and Dog also see the confusion in the sky and see it crash down right in front of the gorilla, causing this beast to go mad as hell because he's been summoned for a fight. He goes and roars in the distance and roars directly at the ocean front. The sounds cause Dog to get agitated and leave the area, with Charlie following behind. Soon they reach the camp, and Charlie tries to figure out a plan with the dog to rescue his friends. Meanwhile, down in the camp, Mike collapses to the ground, and the group sees his body covered in strange veins. Annie then also finally wakes up and is mad as hell, and mentions to everybody here that they will all die. Irene arrives and tries to calm her down and explain her actions, but sees how Mike is concerned. Irene asks Annie if something bit Mike, and she says that he was electrocuted in the ocean by a mysterious monster. Irene then rushes over to go see Cap and tell him the news while Annie tries to help him, but that's when she realizes that her dog isn't here and looks directly at Irene for answers. But that's when she tells Annie the worst news of all. Seeing the pain in Annie's eyes, Irene confesses to Annie that she was just trying to separate the two so she could talk to her without anyone being killed. She asks Annie what happened to her father, but finds out that he died trying to protect her when they got stranded on the island. Irene tries to stay grounded at this heartbreaking news, and Annie starts complaining about some random kid stuff and getting on Irene's nerves, and then Cap politely suggests that they duke it out outside in a friendly deathmatch, and Annie agrees. Annie then stretches and prepares to beat her face in, but notices Irene's face goes sad. She claims that she buried Annie years ago, but then she got word that someone found found her shipwreck years later. She tried to reach that ship before it went missing, and then Annie starts to quickly catch on to what Irene is saying. She's saying that she is Annie's mother, but she doesn't remember her face at all. And Annie says she can't be her mom because she's a horrible person, because her man attacked her dog, and anybody that attacks a girl's dog is a bad person. And this forces Irene to go and try to explain herself. Okay, this is wild, and how bad this writing is. Holy smokes, it's making my brain hurt. No one here, including Irene and Cap, are acting like proper human parents. If I was the mom, I would have avoided all this situation and could have still found Annie by just writing her a cute little letter covered in my scent. Let me explain. The mom tried to rescue Annie and ended up running into this monster when they didn't know it was Annie's pet, so they tried to shoot it and it ran away. But here's the thing, they were so dumb with how they acted because this whole goose chase was unnecessary. They didn't have to have a freaking firebird as the means to get the dog away from Annie. There are easier ways to reach out to Annie and Irene the mom should have known this. It's noted that Annie lost contact with her mother when she was about 
five years old due to childhood amnesia. And this is an age period that is common for children to rapidly begin forgetting memories of her life in her earlier years as a child gets older. Because if I was Irene, aka an attractive single mom, I could have assumed she definitely wouldn't have remembered me if we got separated when she was five and she suffered a traumatic experience when that happened. Even if we didn't know that our baby daddy died a horrible death in front of Annie's eyes, getting lost in a terrifying shipwreck on a deserted island for a little while would certainly be long enough to have her memory have some gaps. In short, we could have assumed it's likely that Annie could have grown up as a feral child. And that is when a child grows up separated from human contact and acts basically like an animal and has zero social behavior. And that is why I would have stayed hidden and would have waited and watched Annie for a day or two before sneaking into her home during a time period that when she went out to hunt. And then using our family's photos, I would have left them all over the ship along with a note and then it would have covered all these items in a perfume scent of ours. Because all of this stuff might trigger something in Annie's memory and also her oil factory senses, which increases our chances of any one of these smells triggering a memory within Annie, causing her to remember me, and then I would slowly and gradually expose myself to Annie. Not all at once, not with guns, and certainly not using a giant freaking firebird to try to separate her from her dog that she clearly is attached to. Meanwhile, Charlie lays out his plan to rescue his friends with the dog. He tells them that they'll set this tree on fire as a distraction while they run to the other side of the camp. Then, once the soldiers come to check it out, he'll sneak in and save his friends and his dad. So they get to work. He then sets this tree on fire and thinks everything is going to go smoothly because these two quickly realize that this isn't a tree. It's a monster's nest. And they quickly wake up and begin swarming Charlie and the dog. The giant flames cause the soldiers to spot it and Charlie. The news quickly reaches the camp and Annie busts out, heading straight to her pet. Howling at the dog, the dog howls back and runs to her and she quickly gets cornered by these flesh-eating monsters. Dog quickly saves her at the last minute while the soldiers manage to stop the rest of these creatures and Cap then rushes to Charlie. The dog quickly turns fierce and attacks Irene but she tells the soldiers to not shoot it. Still mad, Annie tells her that she needs to apologize for hurting dog and these three make up. Charlie then goes to check on Mike and finds out that he's recovering and everybody thinks things are starting to look up. But that's when terrifying screams are heard outside and they stumble upon these giant tentacles crawling the camp. And they quickly pull the remaining soldiers away into the dark ocean. Irene says that she's had enough of this stupid squid and they need to kill it in order to escape. And that's when Charlie has the wildest idea ever. He says that they'll use the giant ape to kill it. He tells the gang that he saw the ape playing with the necklace earlier and thinks this necklace has some important meaning to it. This is why they should try to steal it and make this 40,000 ton monster chase them because that's a brilliant plan. Why? Because they'll be able to lead him directly to the squid. But everybody looks at him like he's crazy because he is. Charlie tells them that he saw artwork of Kong fighting monsters on the temple walls, which means this must be his job. Both creatures are too smart to go near each other, which means luring the monster into the water is their only shot, and they're running out of time to save Mike. Reluctantly, everyone agrees to this crazy plan. Lure Kong into the water and fire off the flare when they do. Charlie gets on to Dog and Annie tells him to hold on to her, and he gets a little bit too excited and they head off. Reaching the gorilla's temple, they approach it cautiously. Charlie mentions that his dad thinks that there's a whole world below this one, but Annie says that she can't go down there or else she'll get sick. Suspicious, Charlie asks, uh, what do you mean by that? But that's when this monster shows up right behind them. Now in plain sight, they move carefully and towards the necklace. And Annie gets a little bit too happy about it and yanks the necklace and runs off like the wind through the gorilla's legs. It chases them like a madman, but that's when Charlie notices Dog whimpering and realizes that Dog has never been trained to carry two people before. At this rate, they won't make it to the beach. Telling Annie she's a cool chick, he jumps off and Kong runs past him. Charlie then tries to keep up with the chase, but stumbles into this trap. He tries to get out of it, but then notices strange people approaching him. The island locals, they get ready to kill him, but Charlie begs them that he's just trying to get home. But this mysterious local warns him that he'll suffer for what he did to Kong. Back at camp, the group waits nervously and sees their worst nightmare running past them in the distance. Cap then notices notices that his son is uh, nowhere to be found and goes after him while Mike overhears this. Irene then gets nervous and wants to go after Annie but gets stopped by this dude who tells her that she can't do anything right now. Meanwhile, Cap goes deep into the jungle but sure enough comes across another monster. This flesh-eating caterpillar. It corners him and he gets ready to fight this 12-foot beast and just then the monster gets shot with a flare and runs off and Cap sees Mike standing behind him and he passes out. Cap notices he's gotten worse and begs for him to hold on. Back near the beach, Annie and Dog finally reach the shores, but the gorilla jumps in front of them, cornering them, and now he's royally pissed off. She throws the necklace at him, waiting for the sea monster to show up. He goes to pick it up, and just then tentacles shoot up from the ocean, grabbing him and pulling him into the ocean, and the waves ripple back to the beach and sweep Annie and the dog into the ocean with them, separating the two. Nearby, the monstrous 
squid continues to drag Kong deeper into the ocean. Oh, okay, shit just got real bad here. Look, if I was them, I would have done the merciful thing by killing our best friend. Let me explain. The group here did everything wrong and how their plan has turned out just proves this. And even if Mike was on the clock, they can't afford to mess up. While this plan does have some merit, assuming Kong could take down this giant sea monster, which wasn't even certain. Which is why I would have added to this plan a second contingency. And we should use our helpless dear old friend here as a guinea pig. It's noted that Irene had access to call another helicopter to them. But the problem was dealing with Captain Squidface over there. This is why aside from luring Kong to the monster, before calling another helicopter to save us, I would have also at the same time tried to move Mike to another part of the island nearby. Then I'm going to make all of us in the group conspire against Mike. This group is full of survivalists and are likely carrying spoons with them. I would get as many pairs of spoons that I could get from them and cut the handles off and drill a small hole at both ends and tie a long enough string to them. This would make a makeshift bass lure that is basically designed to lure fish through sound in the water. Then I'm going to take Mike, tie him up, and toss him onto a makeshift raft with these bass lures and then push him out into the sea. And then with Annie luring Kong to the squid, we could have kept the squid busy enough long enough to escape the island on the new incoming helicopter. And then while on the way of getting out of there, we could have tried to save Annie and I guess the dog. I guess. They reach the bottom of the ocean and the squid chokes the life out of Kong. About to pass out, he sees a sunken boat nearby. Reaching out to it, he grabs it and slams it into the squid's face, barely escaping and reaching the surface. Coughing up blood, Kong sees Dog struggling to survive and Annie calling out to him. Remembering his human companion years ago, he decides to save Dog and return him to Annie, but that's when he gets yanked back into the water and sees his mortal enemy still alive. Pissed off, Kong grabs it and beats the shit out of it, surely leaving it dead this time around. He climbs this rock and pounds his chest as the reigning king of the island. Annie sees his necklace reach the shore and hands it out to him. But then suddenly, a tentacle shoots out and attacks Kong the third time. And he's had enough and picks up the squid and rips it in half and throws it right towards Annie and the dog. Plunging into the water, a huge tsunami forms and heads straight for Annie. She gets on dog and they try to outrun it, but it crashes into them, splitting them up again and dragging Annie onto this rock, cracking her skull and making her black out. She suddenly wakes up in a strange room. Irene enters and she asks where is her dog? She tries to calm her daughter down and says she's been unconscious for two weeks. Desperate, she tries to leave this room, yanks this door open, but sees all these humans around her. And she's confused. She runs to the window and pulls the curtain and discovers that she's back in civilization. There's no King Kong, no dog, and no Charlie. And if you don't want a technical squid motherfucker coming for your throat, then like, comment, let us know what you liked, and of course, didn't like, don't get checked out the hot of the playlist down below.